right, thank you for joining us. Um, recently, you may have noticed we had a survey. Um, just to get an indication from you what you may want to, oh, yep, there's some more. Um, just to get an indication of, uh, from you as to what you may want to um, see in a faith uh, enrichment series. We found that many of you are concerned about work-life balance, like all of us. Uh, there never seems to be enough time to get everything done that we need to get done. And sometimes we find life overwhelming and uh, maybe even at times passing us by. So pretty briefly I'd like to share with you some time management techniques I learned from personal development consultant Brian Tracy. Has anyone ever heard of Brian Tracy? Um, these techniques have helped millions of his readers and seminar attendees to gain balance and control in their daily lives and get a lot more done. My day used to be fairly chaotic. Uh, never seemed as though I could get control over everything that I had to do, and I don't even have kids, so I can only imagine. Um, then my friend Matt recommended his book, Eat That Frog, a book on time management. Uh, it sold a million and a half copies, uh, translated in 14 languages, so it's a big deal. I used one simple strategy from that book and my life changed radically almost overnight. I gained a great deal of control and focus in my day. I began to prioritize my tasks and I began to experience more peace of mind and less stress. And I'm going to share with you that strategy now as well as another strategy that's helped me as well. So how many of you go by a daily schedule? Anybody? Yeah. Kind of. Um, I hate schedules. I always try to go by one, and I'd last maybe a few hours. I would buy the schedule and use it up for a few days or a few hours, and then I would throw it out, or the rest would be blank. If it's working for you, stick with it. But here's something you can use either instead of a schedule or in conjunction with one. Um, I think by using it, you'll get more in control of your day and experience less stress like I did. So first, you take a sheet of paper, and you list all the tasks that you need to do that day. Um, you could list it in the morning, you could list it before, the night before, um, and then you're going to rank them by priority, and I'm going to show you how to do that. You think in terms of possible consequences. So eight tasks are tasks that must be done. If they're not done, there are serious, potentially long-lasting consequences. So for instance, for some of you, maybe going to work is probably an eight task, or uh, times, you know, uh, cooking dinner, uh, if that involves people not eating otherwise. Um, B tasks are tasks that should be done, but are not a strict must. So if you don't do a B task, maybe someone's going to be upset with you, but the world's not going to end, so maybe an email, something. Maybe even an email might be an A task if it's important enough to, to warrant that. Um, so C tasks are tasks that would be nice to do, but that are not a strict must. Uh, so maybe a project you've been thinking about doing around the house, maybe talking to someone you haven't talked to in a while. Um, but there's really very little consequence for not doing it. It's just something that you would like to do. D tasks are tasks to delegate. Um, so there's something that someone else could do for you to free up your time for more important things. Um, so I think I have on there basically get a lazy relative to do something that you've been meaning to do. Um, finally, E tasks are tasks to just eliminate altogether. Um, so Getting used to creative procrastination and outright eliminating things that are of little or no value will go a long way towards uh, um, having more balance. Now what if you have more than one task at a particular level of priority? For instance, let's say you have five A tasks to do that day. Uh, what you do is you label them A1, A2, A3, and so on. And that's really where eat that frog comes from. The frog is A1 because if you eat a frog in the morning, Pretty much the rest of the day, everything looks great. Um, I can certainly testify to that. The rule is you never do a B task before you finish all your A tasks, and you never do a C task before you finish all your B tasks. So you check them off, you cross them off, all the A's, then the B's, then the C's. This is an extraordinarily effective technique for focusing on the things that are most important and downgrading or eliminating things that are of lesser importance. Because we really can't get done every single thing that we would like to get done. So um, by prioritizing systematically, I think that we, uh, we gain a lot of perspective on what's most important. By following this technique, by labeling your tasks by priority, you will get more done, you will experience less stress, more focus, and peace of mind. 
Now, what if your problems are more drastic than just prioritizing your day? What if you just don't know where your life is headed and what you ought to focus on day to day? Here's an excellent technique for figuring that out. You take a sheet of paper and you write goals at the top. 97% of people do not have written goals. And studies show that having goals written down dramatically increases the likelihood that we will achieve those goals. So you write goals at the top and you list 10 different things you'd like to accomplish over the next year or so. You think of what you'd like to accomplish in terms of seven major areas of life. Business and career, family and personal life, money and investments, health and fitness, personal growth and development, social, community, social and community activities, and spiritual development and inner peace. Now when you have those ten things written that you'd like to accomplish over the next year, you try to figure out which one of those goals would have the most impact on all the rest. Which one goal, if accomplished, would prove the most transformative in your life? That is what the great majority of your focus should zero in on in your day-to-day -day life, behind all the other activities that you're responsible for. Uh, Napoleon Hill uh, called this your, your definite purpose in life. But however you want to think about it, it's something that will give you uh, a great deal of focus. So when you've written all this, this list of 10 goals, when you've chosen the one that will have the greatest impact, and decided to make the focal point of your day-to-day -day organization and personal flow, then you will experience unparalleled clarity of mind and energy to get more done in less time. Thank you. So, um, now we have a presentation from Anthony on social media and boundaries and stuff like that, so take it away. Thank you, Jamie. Um, when we spoke with families yesterday, it was brought up regarding the, the topic of managing time, how having a family, and I know this personally, often changes what you view to be a, a priority or a main priority. In fact, I've met many people who have shared with me that it's important in the business of everyday life to have leisure time where you're accessible by your children as one of your main priorities. And I, it's hard for me to wrap my, my mind around that, you know, we always have our list of things that need to get done, um, but to carve out a time where, where my children know that I'm available to them, which we should always be available to them, but where they feel as if you are really available to them by doing something that's not consequential, or if it is that you're able to stop at a heartbeat, um, because if we're always busy in their eyes, then we're always too busy or whatever it is they need. So thank you for, for sharing that, though, because I can personally apply a lot of those principles, Jamie. Um, the topic I'm speaking to, and as Jamie said, these topics are drawn from a survey of how we can, as a church, benefit, um, benefit your families. And it's a topic that actually generates a lot of discussion, and hopefully um, the discussion we had yesterday with families can continue here today. But it's the topic of social media, and bringing about an understanding of the risks, the benefits, and a, and a balance in social media with our children. Now, I'm going to begin this by asking, um, how many of you have children who have their own device with access to new content? Okay. By new content, I even mean they could download something, a game, for example. Um, other than that, you generally have control over what they have, right? As much as when you buy a toy for your children, you have control over what comes in and what comes out. In fact, it's sometimes easier, and I miss the days when it was just uh, loud, battery-operated toys that I got rid of, <laughs> right? Does, that, does anyone have siblings who have no children, and they seem to think that it's okay to buy these toys that if you happen to step the wrong way at night when walking through your living room, and it sounds like something possessed that's talking to you, and you know, or starts singing a song and scares, you know, scares the living daylights out of you. That, those are the toys I would quickly give them, you know? It's very easy to say, well, my children don't use this, or they don't need this, or this, I find this obnoxious. Um, it's even sometimes easy when it comes to television shows to say, I don't want my kids watching Kai, Caillou. Is that how you pronounce his name? Right? Because he's always whining nonstop. It gets, it gets annoying, so we say, no, you're not watching Caillou because I find him annoying. Um, but as they get older, and as they have devices of their own, which 
increasingly is the case, um, we find that this changes. When I say it's increasingly the case, currently the average age for a child getting their first smartphone, well, let me take some guesses. What do you think is the current average age for children getting their own smartphone? Not just cell phone to keep tabs with mom and dad, but an actual smartphone. Yes? Twelve. How much younger? Younger. <laughs> a little older. It's 10.3 10, 10 years old. This was the average taken in a, in, a, in a study in 2015 through 2016, so it might, even be, it might actually be nine years old now. Um, so that is the, in the United States, that is the current average age. This, 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 this stat in particular is from um, Influence Central. It's a big marketing agency trying to find out where there's new consumership. So they're seeing what's actually being used by people now in order to be more accurate in their, in their marketing. So sometimes even more, this can be more accurate than what you see in, in other statistics. Um, from that same list, it says that 64% of kids have access to the internet via their own laptop or tablet, compared to just 42% in 2002. So that might even be higher now, maybe 70% kids have access to the internet on a regular basis. I compare this to when I was a kid and we had to take turns using the dial-up. And of our half minute turn on the internet every single day, about 10 minutes was dialing up, you know? So you've got 20 minutes and your siblings would be breathing down your back for when you'd be their turn to use the computer. And as I got into teenage years, our only social media, so to speak, was AOL Instant Messenger. Am I dating myself here in, in my youth or? Okay, did you use that too, Stephanie? AOL Instant Messenger, yeah. So that was how we communicated on a regular basis, but you had to be on your computer, on your home desktop computer to be using AOL Instant Messenger. None of my friends had cell phones. Um, very few people I knew as a kid had cell phones. As a preteen, my mother, who, you know, had to deal with seven children and all the activities there, my, my dad said, you should get a cell phone. I can't get a hold of you. I never know whose house you're at or what's going on. Or... So she had a cell phone. My dad didn't even have one. He had a pager and a Palm Pilot outside of his office number and home number. So things have changed a lot. Um, you know, this is 20 years ago. Things have changed a lot. We know that 39% uh, of kids get a social media account at the age of 11. 11% 11 got a social media account when they were younger than 10. By social media, I mean something where they have an online presence that is their own. It could be Facebook, which is more often for an older, older generation now than children. It began with college students having it. And quickly, high school students were, were demanding to be able to have access to Facebook. And so then it was open to anybody. It was high school students and college age students, then young adults, and then once those young adults had families of their own and started posting pictures of their children, then our parents joined in on Facebook. And then the teenagers all dropped out <laughs> at that moment. The moment that there were actually parents on Facebook, they said it's not as popular anymore. This is over the last three years. As a youth minister, I've had to adapt how I reach teens to the fact that they're not on Facebook anymore. Um, let's get in, so this is just some of the background information. Getting into the safety aspect of it, though, the vast majority of parents have had no problem taking away a cell phone as a form of punishment or discipline, so to speak, or as a natural consequence for actions or maybe a lack of actions, maybe homework was not finished. So we all know that that's a common and much dreaded punishment among teenagers and, and younger today. In fact, it's such a drastic thing. Let me say this, I'm going to give you a scary statistic, but um, a recent poll of college age and young adult girls indicated that the most memorable thing that occurred to them in high school was not their graduation, but rather the day that they received their first smartphone or their first cell phone. For guys, it was often a car. If, if they did receive a car or have access to a car in high school, that was a car. It was that form of mobility and freedom. And for young ladies, it was the ability to communicate with their friends at a moment's notice. It was a status symbol, too, right? the ability to have that um, communication. So 
we know that that's, you know, that's a tr much dreaded punishment or form of discipline would be to take away the cell phone. Majority also limit the amount of time or times of day their teens can be online. Majority of parents say that they check websites which their teens visit. 60% um, say that they check their children's social media profiles regularly. At least 40% who don't. Um, something to keep in mind. We know that majority of parents friend and follow their children on Facebook or Twitter or other social media platforms to be present there for them also, to be aware of what's going on. Something someone wrote to me about this sort of a strategy as parents when dealing with social media is we, we often are afraid, and probably rightly so, of being helicopter parents. Of We look back at the days where school is done, chores are done, you know, parents say, my job is done for today. You are not coming back until dinner time. And you just did whatever the neighborhood kids did. Um, that had its risks, you know. And sometimes there were negative consequences to that. Sometimes there were kids that I shouldn't have been playing with. Kids who would steal, kids who would lie, kids who would disobey their parents. Um, but I learned from that, right? And I'm sure we can all attest that we learned from those experiences. And so sometimes we say, well, with social media, I don't want to be a helicopter parent step in. With the internet, I don't want to step in. But what we have to realize is that the digital presence that our children are a part of is sometimes more prevalent in their lives than their physical sort of in the moment present presence of where they are at. Even when they're with their friends, they might be more present to what's going on in their social media accounts than they are to the friend that's right with them. Something that our teens here at St. Patrick's have shared with me and the very reason why they have never fought back when we collect cell phones for events. Because they realize that they are often not present for others, or maybe more often that their friends are not present to them when phones are in the picture. So this is something where when it's tested, when we test it with our teens even, um, to the extreme of going for a week during our service camp, not having any access to social media, the response is overwhelmingly positive. Now we do get the kids who have, say, I don't know if you know much about, say, Snapchat, but in Snapchat you share, you exchange Snapchat, Snapchat if you exchange your Snapchat with somebody else, it's usually an exchange because you want to have an equal number of followers. And then you choose who you send a particular photo to, a particular Snapchat to. Um, it could be to a particular person, it could be to a group of people, but there's this thing called a streak. A streak is the amount of consecutive times you've sent an image to somebody and, and gotten replies back. So it shows a sense of status, a sense of digital power or presence or popularity that you're capable of sending out images and getting a response. That you have that much sway. Just think of the pressure involved in that. That on a daily basis, there are young people who are not only dealing with the pressures of school and extracurriculars and family life and rivalries and siblings and whatever else, but they're dealing with the pressure of feeling as if they need to respond to people that they might realize they do not like. People that they don't want to associate with, maybe for good cause, maybe these people really make them feel horrible about themselves, but that they might be doing something to that person's popularity status by not responding. There could be backlash. This person might not like me. They might speak badly to their friends about me because I'm not responding to them. I have teens who have brought these fears to me. And in fact, I think that's one of the reasons why they like when we do our service week, because then they can tell everybody, I'm not going to be available for a week. It's an opportunity to end the streaks that they don't want to keep, maybe to cut, cut off contact with people that they don't feel they need to be in contact with, but it's not healthy. Um, then there's the other extreme where I have students who hire out people to take care of their social media empire and they'll have friends that keep their streaks going for them and they'll take a number of photos ahead of time so they can keep the streaks going while they're away. The people that, you know, it's, it's that important to them. It is, it is, it is what it is. Um, but to realize that that is a pressure. And I want all parents, especially those with younger children, to be aware that this is a world that already exists. It's a world that we already have to address as a, as a reality. 
And as a parent of an eight-year-old, six-year-old, four-year-old, and two-year-old, two, four, six, eight, um, I can really appreciate, that was not intentional. I can, I, I readily, uh, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of, you know, I have this eight-year-old, what kind of world as a teenager is she going to be a part of? Right? What kind of pressures exist that did not exist when I was a kid? Because predominantly we had more family time than social time as a child, and that's increasingly um, the opposite. It's already flopped. We're already on the other side of the hill in that regard. That social time among teenagers um, with peers is much more dominant than family time. So what are some possible strategies, and I'm hoping to hear from you guys because I'm not going to address all of them. There's not enough time to do that. Um, but before I move into strategies for handling that situation, on the note of safety, we will say that nearly 50% of teens have their parents, their parents know that they can look through um, their, cell, their cell phone records, whether it be uh, their text messaging or phone call records. What some parents have even gone so far as to do is to link, say it's a young teenager or a preteen, to link their cell phone account to a tablet or something, another device that's already in the home. It's very easy to do that within, within technology. I'd look into that if that's something that you have a child in that age, age range. You can actually see what social media or what, what things look like on a daily basis, what kind of notifications and what kind of world exists for your child. It's like when you had just a home phone, you always knew who was calling regularly. Or if people had to come knock on the door, you knew which kids wanted to play. You knew about your child's social life. And I think now, increasingly, it's much harder to keep up. Another solution that a parent shared was that they would hold on to their kid's phone for maybe a couple of hours once a week, where this kid did not have the phone. Instead of turning the phone off, the parent held on to it. And they got an idea of what this 10-year-old was receiving on a regular basis from her friends. Just so rather than spying, it's sort of taking a, a sampling, like we do, you know, people do in marketing. You take a sampling, selective sampling to get an accurate picture of things. You don't need to be spying on your child 24-7. That's not healthy for anybody involved. But the idea of having that sampling on a regular basis of this is what it's like in a two-hour window for my child. Um, that's a safety measure. Another one, nearly 50% report using some form of software, filtering software in their homes. It's something that's also highly been highly recommended to me. Right? My, my daughter, I don't know if any of your kids are like this, it's a phenomenon among younger generation. She's gotten tired of all the shows that are on Netflix, which is on hard to believe because I still have shows I'm catching up on. But at her age, she would rather watch certain there's cooking shows that she watches online. Um, I don't know why she likes watching cooking shows online. <laughs> Laura Vitale is one she watches. She watches, um, when she was younger, she would watch kids open up eggs yes. for hours on end. Um, they like to watch children opening gifts. That's a big one. It makes a multi-million dollar industry right now is children who open gifts for other children to watch them opening gifts. <laughs> Um, it, is, it is a huge industry right now in entertainment, is to watch kids open gifts on the computer. Um, but I don't know what kind of ads show up. I don't know what kind of suggestions come in a suggestion bar when she's done watching that video. Right? What do I teach her about this? A parent yesterday mentioned to me that something she learned was when deciding how mature a child is for say a smartphone or for their own device that has access to the internet. The question isn't, um, you know, when will they have access to certain content? It's if you give them this, this device, they are going to have access to content. Content that you don't desire them to see is going to be there. So the real question is, is your child mature enough to see things that are inappropriate for them to see? And if the answer is no, then they're not mature enough to have access to that at all, to that possibility. Um, I liken it to, you know, a parent who um, is in a conversation with somebody else, and afterwards their child, kind of curious about what that, that's about, they say, well, what were you talking about? And you say, no, no, I, I can't share that with you right now. 
And the child says, why not? I want to know. What, what were you talking about? And then the parent then takes this, this briefcase or something along those lines and says to the child, I'd like you to lift this for me and carry it for me. And the child tries and says, I can't carry that yet. And he says, this, this is exactly why I can't share this with you. There are some things that you're not ready to carry. And we all know this as parents, and we all know this as former children at some point in time, that there are things that are just too heavy for us to carry. So the question is, is my child mature enough to recognize what they can or cannot carry? Are they mature enough to realize what to do in a situation where there's something that's inappropriate? And that's something we all need to take on a person-by-person -person basis. Now, I'm willing to take um, you know, any suggestions from you guys. I'm going to open this up. I will say that something that was brought up in the past by numerous families and worked tremendously was when providing a cell phone to their child for the first time, that that cell phone came with a contract. And I use the word contract because you know, it's something that comes across as means something. It has a definite meaning. It means that if the contract is broken, that that gift is now a void. Right? That you cannot now provide that gift to them anymore. The phone is a gift, it's not a right. It's not something anyone has a right to. So when the phone is provided, you sit down with the child and you say, before this is really yours, I'd like you to initial off next to these bullet points what is or isn't appropriate content, or what is or isn't appropriate use, what are and are not appropriate times to use this device. Um, and I think that that's worked really well for a lot of families because it gives you something concrete to look back on and to judge actions and consequences against. Lastly, something that I share with teenagers is that we are often, and they are, they are aware of this, um, but it's good to remind them nonetheless, especially those who are younger, and that is that our virtual presence, our presence on, on social media and on the internet has consequences that are the same, if not um, more drastic than in every everyday life, day-to-day -day life. You know, if one of our children were at a playground to throw a rock at another child, there would be consequences. We would need to sit down with the, the parents of the other child. We need to make sure that apologies are made, that amends are made. We would need to make sure that that situation is handled um, appropriately. But when the same thing is done over a virtual space, over in social media, for example, a child slings repetitive insults at another child, things that really hurt. What are the consequences? What's the reaction to that? Do we say, oh, they're just kids. They don't mean it. They just, it's what the kids do on social media now. It's an argument. They had an argument. Right? It's much easier to make an excuse and say it's an argument. But what people need to realize is that everything can be reported now. And I share this with the teens. If you are cyberbullying somebody, that actions can be taken against, legal action can be taken against you for that. And that they need to be made aware that what's done virtually over social media has equivalence in what is done person to person. Um, that, that we need to make sure that we strategize as, as adults because we have a broader sense of what's going on here than the teens do. They might have more particular sense of what's going on in particular apps, or particular social media settings, but they don't have the broader picture of whether or not this is a human social media app platform, for example. Are people being treated as humans here? Or has the human element been taken out and now it's being replaced with something else? And I think we all know we need to set the example ourselves. You look at Facebook, for example, and adults using Facebook, how easy it is to, to get into arguments. Um, I rarely ever post an argument anymore because I find myself getting so sucked into it. I would so much rather share with a friend in person and talk with them about whatever disagreement there is than to, to put it on a public bulletin board. That's akin to somebody going to a bulletin board, writing a statement they disagree with, posting it up there, some bold statement, and then me going and writing my own statement and posting it there. It's passive aggressive. Right? So arguments on social media can often be very passive aggressive. And we need to realize that that's not how friendship is kept or how good dialogue is, and I think we can model that for our children to a certain degree. But I'd like to hear from, from you guys. Um, 
as we round this up, what are some either fears or solutions? Maybe we can draw some wisdom because I, all I've done here is present you with statistics. Um, I am by no means an expert. I, my students actually make fun of me. They consider that that this is uh, disqualification to talk about media. I have students that have gone so far as to say that um, 1994 has called you and there was no reception, right? But uh, I was at the National Catholic Youth Conference and I have a deactivated iPhone. This is my credibility in a sense, not that I need, need credibility in that regard. But uh, this was my technology for years. And I had the newest iPhone for a number of years and I said, I don't need this. I don't need to have alerts constantly going off. I need my phone to know when my family or work or something is, you know, a call or a text, I need that. But I don't need to be checking alerts nonstop on social media platforms or how many likes this post got or anything like that. So I can plug this in and I can leave it at home for a day by accident. It's not going to affect me in any way. Um, I gave this to a teenager to use the flashlight at a con concert at, a, at the National Catholic Youth Conference. And so, you know, this teen who didn't have a phone, and there are teenagers who don't have phones, um, you know, she was waving, here I can't even get my flashlight to work, she was waving this, and I pulled out my, my flip phone and started doing this, and they were making fun of me for that too. Mm -hmm. But um, I think what's important to keep in mind is that we can't let technology rule our own lives. We need to teach our children that, that they can't let technology have so much influence over their lives and social media so much influence over their lives that they can't really be themselves or take the time to discover who they are um, to the people around them and what role they have in the family. So I'm not turning this over to you. What are, what are some ideas you guys have or thoughts on this topic? I like that you take the phones when you do stuff with the kids. Um, in my four seasons coaching at the high school, yeah. the thing I find like the very most concerning, especially with the girls, is that they're never just with their friends. Like they're always have to be like flipping their hair and afraid that someone could take a picture of them and post it to social media. You can't like have a frumpy day or a fat day or like a blah day in high school anymore. You're always at the jeopardy of like your friend's cell phone. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to have practice or um, activities that your kids go to where they yeah. have to interact like in yeah. that time without a phone to be real for a little while because that just doesn't exist anymore. There's a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. um, on a, that's, and that's a scary thought. I think that guys have it easier in that regard that kind of skim under the radar a little bit when it comes to that. A, a guy could have his hair like all completely you know, facing a different direction and maybe not think twice about it. Um, but I think on that same note, another, another thought that kind of scares, scares me to think about and scares the teenagers, and that is that everything